Welcome to the University of Cambridge Alumni Festival and thank you to the team for organising this lecture today. My name is Neve Gallagher. I'm a lecturer in British and Irish history at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of St Catherine's College. So over the next hour, I want to bring you back 100 years to talk about an event I'm sure many of you have heard of. That event is the First World War or the Great War as it was known at the time. If I were delivering a similar lecture in person, I would ask my audience how many of you are familiar with Ireland's part in the First World War? Usually, I would watch the heads in front of me twist and turn. Can't see yours today, unfortunately. And after some time, one or two hands might stick up. The volunteers would almost always tell me about the Easter Rising, a famous rebellion which happened in Dublin in April 1916 and that Ireland gained independence from Britain soon after the 1918 armistice. Very good, I would usually reply. But what has this to do with the First World War? At this point, the volunteers are usually less certain. I remember one occasion when the sequence played out in front of a class of students. After waiting for the class to ponder my question, a confident student with a smile on their face put their hand up and said, the rising happened in the middle of the war. A logical answer for sure, but not really the critical response I was after. So this exchange that I would have with a student, which I had with the student in question, demonstrates the events that come to mind when we think of Ireland during the years which spanned the First World War. From 1912 until 1923, Ireland experienced what has been called the Irish Revolution, a series of political developments which resulted in the partition of the island and the reconfiguration of the United Kingdom. These years are of major importance in the constitutional history of Britain and Ireland. The 1801 Act of Union, which had united Ireland with Great Britain in law, though perhaps less in spirit, was replaced by a series of other legislative agreements, creating two states on the island. The Irish Free State, which later became the Republic, and that of Northern Ireland. The agreements that underpinned these states' creation were at the heart of bitter conflicts, firstly in the infancy of the Free State during the Civil War of 1922-23, and more recently in Northern Ireland. The legacy of the Constitutional Revolution continues to haunt the present. The Good Friday Agreement, the treaty signed in 1998 between British, Irish and Northern Irish representatives with international backing, officially brought an end to the Troubles. This treaty is once again in the news. The Northern Ireland Protocol, designed to enable Britain to leave the European Union in a way which preserves core tenets of the agreement, was amended by Prime Minister Boris Johnson just over a week ago, altering what had been agreed between partners and triggering an outcry from international lawyers and ministers. The Irish Revolution may have ended 100 years ago, but the legislation that it produced and the question of who has the right to amend it remains alive and well. It continues to be a part of our politics of the present and the evolving relationship between the two islands. The important constitutional developments of 100 years ago are only one aspect of a phenomenon which touched communities, families and individuals throughout the island of Ireland and in Britain as well. To divert attention away from this political history seems almost like a sideshow to the main event. To look at the First World War seems like a sideshow to the main event. A support act you almost have to suffer until the band you pay to see takes central stage. But it is this sideshow that I want to talk to you about today because the First World War was no backing act in Ireland or elsewhere. The world conflict that began in July 1914 mobilised 65 million troops across the globe and claimed 20 million military and civilian lives. It destroyed three empires, four if we were to include that of Germany, and it witnessed the rise of powerful international ideologies that sparked the horrors of the 20th century. The United States of America took its place among the great powers of the world as a result of its tremendous financial lending capacity and its decisive military role in bringing the conflict to a conclusion in 1918. The global shift in power relations 
was especially obvious on the European continent, as nationalist movements, particularly in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans, exploded in the demise of empire, reconfiguring the map of Europe, just as the United Kingdom itself was reconfigured. The First World War was a major episode in world history and in Ireland's history as well. Why it has been forgotten and what it can tell us about the 20th century is what I want to talk to you about today. It won't be news to many of you that religion and political identity have long been linked in Ireland, and this was especially true during the 1910s. In the run-up to the conflict, Protestants who were largely Unionist and supported the Union with Great Britain, and Catholics who were mainly Nationalists, had been bitterly divided over a piece of legislation called Home Rule, which was slowly edging its way through Parliament. Home Rule would have granted the island of Ireland a measure of self-government, less than what Scotland or Wales has today. Yet in the context of the early 20th century, this sparked tremendous opposition from Unionists in Ireland and Britain, who wanted no change in the constitutional relationship between the two islands. Nationalists and Unionists, particularly Unionists in Ulster, the northern province of Northern Ireland, today, Northern Province of Ireland, which is Northern Ireland today, most Northern Ireland today, I'll clarify that later, had polarised over the bill. So these four images that you can see in front of you demonstrate the evolution of polarisation. On the top left, the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant was signed in September 1912 by a quarter of a million men and a corresponding women's declaration was signed by even more women to protest against Home Rule for Ireland. Sir Edward Carson, the leader of the Ulster Unionists, pictured here to the right of the Covenant, was the first to sign. Within months, Unionists had formed the paramilitary group, the Ulster Volunteer Force, UVF, pictured below Carson training with wooden sticks in Belfast. In April of 1914, this threat became all the more serious when Unionists successfully imported 25,000 rifles and between three to five million rounds of ammunition to Larne and County Antrim. Nationalists responded in kind, organising a rival paramilitary organisation, the Irish Volunteers, pictured on the bottom left, who were determined to defend the implementation of Home Rule when it finally became law. They even attempted their own gun running at Hoth, outside Dublin on the 26th of July, but were unsuccessful. Later that day, following an altercation with a crowd at Bachelor's Walk in Dublin, a detachment of the King's own Scottish borderers opened fire on the crowd, killing three and injuring more than 30. The seriousness of the Irish situation and what to do about Ulster if Home Rule were put in place was such that it dominated parliamentary debates in the last days of July 1914. In the first of his epic volumes in the Great War, Winston Churchill captured what occupied the minds of ministers. Under the heading entitled The Crisis, July 24th to 30th, the first of his entries reads Fermanagh and Tyrone. Only the second reads The Austrian Ultimatum to Serbia, the, the important document which initiated the sequence of events that resulted in the outbreak of war. As July became August, the Ulster question was rapidly overshadowed by escalating hostilities on the continent. As part of the United Kingdom, Ireland had little choice about whether or not it would take part. When the United Kingdom entered the war on the 4th of August, Ireland entered it as well. Several historians have noted the surprising turn of events in Ireland, as large sections of Unionists and Nationalists backed the British war effort. In September 1914, John Redmond, leader of the Nationalist Irish Parliamentary Party, which had agitated for Home Rule, declared that Irish men should go, and I quote, wherever the firing line extends. By the end of that month, three new military divisions had been raised in Ireland for active service as part of Lord Kitchener's new armies, the 10th, the 16th and the 36th divisions. The 16th contained many nationalists, 
36th contained many unionists, and the 10th contained a mixture of both. Across the United Kingdom, Kitchener's new armies were special. Unlike the regular army, volunteers were drawn from all sections of society, with a strong showing from the middle classes. And these men had little or no former military experience. Kitchener's new army was a civilian army. If we are to properly understand the impact of the First World War on Britain and Ireland, it is to recognise that this was a society voluntarily embarking on war in the early years of the conflict, unlike on the continent, where conscription was in operation from the outset, creating a different dynamic between the governors and the governed. While these new armies were preoccupied with training, ordinary regulars and reservists were shipped to Belgium and France to experience some of the greatest movements and territory in the entire war between the Allies and Central Powers. An aspect of the war that sharply contrasts with the mud, trenches and stalemate that we usually think of when we recall the First World War. Irish regulars took part in some of the earliest engagements. As in Britain, working class Irish families who made up the rank and file of the regular army were some of the first units to take part in the initial weeks of the conflict in the battles of Mont and the first battle of Ypres. At least 210,000 Irish men served in the war from Ireland alone. Perhaps 30,000 were killed. At first glance, these figures pale in comparison to the 5 million or so men who served from Great Britain and the 700,000 700, or so lives that were lost on the island. But these numbers deserve to be looked at a little more closely. Emigration, population size, age demographics and rural and urban differences are only some of the factors affecting the comparison between recruits from Britain and Ireland. The late Keith Jeffrey found that between a quarter and a third of all available young men in Ireland served in the conflict, and I quote, a strikingly high proportion in the absence of conscription. My own research has indicated that at least a further 25,000 Irish-born men enlisted in Canada and Australia, and similar numbers of Irish men enlisted in Britain in 1914 alone. These figures don't include the contributions of the second generation, who often consider themselves as Irish as their parents, or indeed enlistments in Irish America, the home of the most recent waves of Irish emigration. The history of Ireland's military contribution in this war far exceeds the numbers that are commonly cited in histories of Ireland and the geography of where mobilisation occurred. In Ireland, the actions of the new army divisions made a stamp in contemporary consciousness. The first new army division to experience combat was the 10th division at Gallipoli. It was the first division to be formed and as such attracted the most enthusiastic men across the political spectrum. In August 1915, it took part in the first wave of landings at Suvla Bay on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo, um, an artist representation of that particular landing. This is one for, for Anzac Cove. Like the other British units the Irish served with, they were monumentally ill-prepared for what happened next. The disastrous Dardanelles campaign, the brainchild of, of Wilson Churchill, meant that British, Irish and Imperial soldiers landed as sitting ducks for the Ottoman forces. In the Irish case, at least, they had received no training for the amphibious landings that they had to undertake. And the war diaries of men from that time resemble the horrors of the D-Day landings. Today, the 10th is the most forgotten Irish division of the three raised in Ireland. And it took until 2010 for the Irish state to officially recognize the more than 3,000 Irish men that perished in the campaign. And this is because of the politicization of the war in unionist and nationalist memory. In Ulster, unionists remember the actions of the 36th Ulster Division on the 1st of July 1916, the first day of the Battle of the Somme. 
Over 5,000 Ulster men were wounded, killed and went missing on one day alone. Their actions and the fact that the division comprised many men from the Unionist paramilitary organisation, the UVF, which had mobilised to defend Ulster from Home Rule, became imprinted on Ulster Unionist consciousness. War memorials established in the years after the conflict were dedicated to the men who had fallen and history books began to record their actions, taking on a sacrificial quality which has endured until this day. During the recent Northern Irish Troubles, the memory of the Great War took on additional political connotations. Loyalists formed paramilitary organisations, one of which was the newly revived UVF, who linked their actions in the Troubles with those of the earlier wartime generation. Memory of the war became bound up with the politics of the present. It was a site where rival identities played out, a symbol of those who supported an enduring British rule in Northern Ireland and a target for those who did not. In 1987, our Remembrance Day gathering in Enniskillen, County Fermanagh, was attacked by the Republican group, the IRA, killing 11 people. This episode demonstrated the extent to which the war had been disowned by Irish Republicans. Even for nationalists, whose views on the Northern Irish situation were less extreme, the war was not considered to be a part of their history. Their history, instead, as Republican history, was a fighting for independence from Britain. The national history, which had taken root in the Irish Free State, which is now part of the formative history of the Republic. The Easter Rising is often seen as the spark which ignited the sequence of events that resulted in independence. The history of Irish men who had served in the 16th and the 10th Irish divisions within the British Army did not comfortably sit with a history where the Irish had fought against that very entity in the effort to gain independence. At what point these men were forgotten in the national memory is difficult to say, but if we are to rewind back to the war itself, the opposite was in fact true. It is well known, <coughs> pardon me, that the Gallipoli campaign <coughs> made a formative mark on Australia and New Zealand. And on the 25th of April each year, many people in both countries commemorate the Anzacs who embarked on their first wave of landings in April 1915. In Ireland too, a similar desire to memorialise the actions of the 10th emerged from as soon as news was received that the division had landed at the Dardanelles. The Gaelic Athletic Association, Ireland's biggest sporting body, had taken a firm anti-recruitment stance during the war. <clears throat> Several of its members had links to the radicals who would be involved in the rising and later lead the move movement for independence. Today, Croke Park, the GAA's biggest stadium in Dublin, has a famous mound called Hill 16, a tribute to the Easter Rising and the freedom which Republicans felt the rebellion had been for. Yet at, un, until at least 1931, this mound was actually called Hill 60, in memory of the hill which the Royal Dublin Fusiliers and other Irish regiments of the British Army had been tasked with capturing at Gallipoli. This forgotten history, the desire of wartime nationalists to commemorate the men who had fallen, even if they had uncertain views about recruitment to the British forces, had a much longer history that goes well beyond the partition of Ireland and the creation of the new free state. This picture, taken in the city centre of Cork in 1925, demonstrates that the Irish war dead were certainly not forgotten by their contemporaries. <clears throat> this is all the more surprising, given that Cork was at the epicentre of the Anglo-Irish War of 1921, remembered by many in Ireland as the War of Independence, and was a Republican stronghold during the Civil War of 1922-23, for a time even calling itself the Republic of Cork, as a tribute to the anti-treaty rebels who fought against the Free State Government over the treaty that had been agreed with Great Britain. 
mass remembrance of the Irish war dead during the years of partition and Irish independence demonstrate a much more complicated relationship between nationalists and the First World War than a simple process of mass forgetting. In almost all of the countries that endured the conflict, it took a very long time for historians and the public alike to think about the actions of men, women and children who supported the war effort at home. This is in many ways understandable. The losses experienced by families, the desire for governments to remember or even propagandize their part in the war, and the wish of veterans to honor lost comrades meant that the men who died took center stage. Only since the 90s have historians looked again at how home fronts responded to the war. It is commonly forgotten that no country would have been able to fight the First World War had it not been for the support of societies. People at home ensured that vital supply lines, military equipment and support services were forthcoming. And this was matched by a mass voluntary effort to sustain the war effort. Volunteers produced an unquantifiable output of what were termed comforts, and they produced these for the troops and their families, and they hosted fundraisers for a variety of charitable causes. Their efforts were only part of the mobilisation of the home front, in which medical services, farmers and labourers, churches, charities, entertainers, and above all, the postal service, ensured that the men at the front and families, friends and acquaintances at home could provide mutually reinforcing support networks which sustained morale and enabled the war to go on. These examples of how people supported their troops assumes greater significance when we think of Ireland, where there was a strong but hitherto unacknowledged war effort. To take an example, the British Red Cross Society established branches throughout Ireland which were run by volunteers in various localities. Middle-class women were the cogs behind the machine of war work, dominating charities and voluntary associations at organisational and managerial levels. Each year, the Red Cross organised an Our Day Fund to encourage financial donations to the organisation on behalf of the war effort. A report published after the war described how the three southern provinces of Ireland, where the majority of nationalists resided, should have proportionately contributed almost £14,000 in donations when compared to Britain's contribution. In fact, the southern provinces gave over £60,000 and donations increased year on year. Behind these statistics lies a history of activism where volunteers set up and ran Red Cross branches in their localities and relied on the support of local communities, newspapers, and perhaps most importantly, a favourable attitude towards the desire to raise funds, which in the end were proportionally greater than those raised in Britain. This is only one example of how people across Ireland undertook various projects to assist the war effort throughout the conflict. Such support contrasts starkly with what happened in Russia, where the revolutions of February and October 1917 caused a major collapse of the army as the conflict lost moral support at home. A widespread failure in morale is a crucial reason that caused the mutinies in the German army in 1918 and the ultimate success of the Allies. The absence of mutinies amongst Irish soldiers and the British forces during the war and the widespread evidence of home front engagement demonstrates a commitment to the Allied war effort amongst Irish nationalists that has gone unacknowledged. In my book, I attempt to answer why the commitment amongst so many nationalists was so great and for so long, given the developing constitutional crisis. So minor spoiler alert here. One of the reasons I think that that support was so strong was because the conflict was considerably closer to Ireland than has generally been thought. On the 7th of May 1915, the New York Liverpool bound passenger liner, the RMS Lusitania, 
<clears throat> was torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Cork, very south of Ireland. Out of the 2,000 people aboard, 1,198 persons were killed, a figure comparable to the losses of the much more famous ship liner three years earlier, the Titanic. This attack was the first major event of the naval war that had a strong impact on public opinion in Ireland, not least because several Irish persons were travelling on board and the visual evidence of destruction was widely seen. Hundreds of bodies were brought to Queenstown, what is today called Cove, as the local community grappled with the immensity of the tragedy. Photographs like this one capture this episode of mass death and contemporary newspapers offer a lens into how this episode intensified attitudes against Germany and generated support for the Allies. The Lusitania was only the beginning of Ireland's concern about the naval war an aspect of the First World War which has been virtually forgotten. We remember the war as one of armies and mobilised in trenches in France and Flanders, but the war had several other military dimensions, even if they did not decide the final outcome. The naval war generated fear, anxiety and outrage, and when Germany embarked on a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917, indiscriminately attacking both civilian and military shipping, and incidentally a major reason why America entered the conflict in 1917, this effect on Ireland was great. So this map is one of several which demonstrates the proximity of the naval war to Ireland. <clears throat> the Irish home front was much closer to hostilities than has been remembered. She suggests that nationalists lost interest in the conflict or forgot about the war once the movement for independence got underway, ignores this vital dimension of the conflict, which coastal communities had to put up with and respond to in the very years that the independence movement gathered pace. The naval war also fostered an even more scary prospect. Many of you have no doubt heard of the potato famines of the 1840s, and in the 1910s, the memory of this traumatic event has been passed down through the generations and is recalled firsthand by the elderly whose parents had experienced its worst effects. Unrestricted submarine warfare threatened food imports to Ireland at a time when much of the land was used for pasture. The spectre of food scarcity revived the ghost of the Great Famine and the response of rural Ireland to a government decreed tillage campaign resulted in a national effort that might find its comparison with the Dig for Victory campaign remembered in Britain during the Second World War. So these are only some examples to demonstrate that the First World War loomed much larger in the history of 1910s Ireland than has been warranted. But the question I am often asked is, so what? The radicalisation of Irish nationalism in these years still happened. This was confirmed by the general election of 1918, in which the political party Sinn Féin, previously a minor force in parliamentary nationalism, swept to victory with 73 seats, while the Irish Parliamentary Party, the old Home Rule Party, only won six. The other seats were largely won by unionists, particularly in Ulster, as you can see on this map. In one way, the history of the First World War can reinforce what we already know. The war years can be seen as a time of political division, the creation of oppositional new army units, the owning and disowning of the war in unionist and nationalist memory, the strong connections between the 36th Ulster Division and loyalist association with Britishness in Northern Ireland, and the very real political divisions that became further entrenched during the war and led to the reconfiguration of the two islands. The problems of Ireland's 20th century were certainly enhanced by this conflict. But the First World War also encouraged a more inclusive history, which has attracted considerably less historical or popular attention. At every level in my research, 
I found cooperation between Irish Protestants and Catholics in aid of the war effort. Irish women of both creeds worked in voluntary associations of all kinds. Coastal communities rallied together to support victims of the naval war and communities of all creeds mourned in solidarity despite their confessional differences. Political parties on both sides attempted to politicize the Irish military effort, but the military was unintentionally a great leveler. The most eager men who find themselves in the 10th division had little choice about the creed of their comrades. And while historians have been understandably fascinated by the 36th and later on the 16th divisions, they overshadow the more numerous enlistments in other often non-Irish units in Britain, Canada, Australia and beyond, where ethnically homogenous groups of Irishmen were much more difficult to maintain. The conflict itself was its own master. By 1917, the new army divisions were sufficiently damaged by the war that they had become much less recognisable. And following the imposition of conscription in Britain in 1916 and its extension in 1918, the agency which civilians had in shaping the character of the military was much reduced as the war of attrition dragged on. The First World War cannot change our understanding of the constitutional events which led to partition or the reconfiguration of the United Kingdom, though it can, for instance, add a great deal more understanding to the events surrounding the massive protests in Ireland against conscription in 1918, which I won't dwell on right now. But it can also tell us that concerns other than the domestic political situation preoccupied people to an astonishing degree amidst the Irish Revolution, fostering different types of communities that did not adhere, adhere to political or religious groupings. While such inclusivity was ultimately insignificant politically, it was, however, important socially and defined mass demonstrations of cross-community remembrance stretching well into the interwar period, demonstrates the triumph of solidarity that politicians could not control. This forgotten history of the Irish in the war has been forgotten because the questions we have asked about the past have led to different answers. By looking at the end point of the revolution and projecting backwards in time to figure out the events that led to its outcome, Historians have unintentionally squeezed out the actions of individuals and communities whose behaviour seemed at, odd with these, at odds with these trends. By asking different questions, by changing the lens through which we view the past, other realities can come into view. So I hope that this brief lecture has helped you to think about one such reality by considering the forgotten history of the Irish in the First World War. If you have enjoyed this talk, I would like to know more about the subject. My publisher, Bloomsbury, has very kindly given me a rather generous discount code to share with you today, should you wish to buy my book or know somebody who might be interested. So please do take note of these details and I will now take some questions. How did the current mutiny factor into the UK government's thinking about managing the UVF and the Irish volunteers? Um, Mark, this is a great question. The Curra mutiny was effectively a mutiny of the British Army <clears throat> in mid-1914, where senior officials, senior military men, <clears throat> declared that they would not enforce um, law and order in Ulster, and they would not fight against their, um, their kinsmen in Ulster, the Unionists in Ulster who had mobilised against Home Rule. <clears throat> um, so, it's a really interesting episode that this is one of the few examples in history where the British Army has effectively almost mutinied against the government, <clears throat> which is you know, something that has been unheard of for, for hundreds of years. How did it factor into the thinking? I think it concerned a lot of politicians who were deciding what to do about Ulster for many weeks before the conflict. <clears throat> um, indeed, I suppose you can say many years before the conflict started, ministers have been trying to think about what to do about the Ulster question and various ideas have been put on the table. So it did factor into the thinking more in that it, it, it effectively made the, the unionist protest against Home Rule seem even more serious and flagged up how little ministers knew about how to resolve the situation. One of the things that it may have encouraged 
is the idea of white partition as a solution to the problem. And this was something that was on the cards from 1912. <clears throat> Ronan Fanning in his book, Fatal Path, uh, talks about that. So I think that would be a sort of brief answer to that, that question. And we'll move on to the next one. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. So why did so many Irish nationalists sign up to fight for the British Empire? <clears throat> was it economic hardship? Another very good question, Julian. Um, I suppose what we're, what we're doing here is we're, we're sort of join, joining two things together and we're saying two and two is four. Irish nationalists may have joined up within the British Empire. Whether or not they joined to defend the empire is a different question. <clears throat> Some, we might say, did. Certainly in Canada and Australia, where Irish nationalists had lived for some time, had settled there, had families there, and perhaps even the second generation now held fairly influential positions there, they felt like the empire had really benefited them. And in fact, what you do find in the First World War is what I would call a sort of sense of Catholic loyalism, small L loyalism, as opposed to the political creed of loyalism in Northern Ireland. So you do see this unusual evolving relationship for Irish Catholics who had emigrated from the 1860s onwards and would establish their homes in within the British Empire, actually thinking that the empire was worth defending. So, so that'd be one reason. But of course, people enlisted for a variety of reasons, from the big reasons like uh, it was a war for civilization or later on a war for democracy, to the small reasons such as, as you mentioned, economic hardship or, you know, to, to get away, to travel. Um, I've read war diaries and letters from Irish Australians <clears throat> who were really incentivized by the idea of going to Europe because they could then go to Ireland afterwards. Seems like a very odd way to promote international travel um, 100 years ago, but you know, it definitely was part of the thinking of, of, some, of some men at the time. So there's lots of reasons really, um, but yeah, but hopefully, hopefully that's answered your question. Okay, next one, Des. <clears throat> Can you say something about the organization of the regiments? <clears throat> Give me for coffee. Raised in the north and south of Ireland during the war, did those from Ulster receive more favourable treatment? <clears throat> okay, another really good question. So politicians at the time, John Redmond, <clears throat> who was leading the Irish Parliamentary Party, and Sir Edward Carson, leading the 36th, <clears throat> Ulster, sorry, leading the Ulster Unionist Party, were lobbying with the government to get certain favours bestowed on them. And the 36th was much more successful in this. Uh, it, it managed to get particular insignia um, not, to, not least the, the Ulster designation in the name of the division as well, um, which, the, which the Irish were unable to get. They got, the 16th Irish, they got the 16th and 10th Irish division designation, but they were unable to get particular insignia, insignia and sort of um, other, other sort of visual aspects of the regiments that would have allowed them to promote uh, uh, their own particular version of history. So the 36th was more successful. But when you put it into context with the rest of Britain, for example, you find that actually the favours given to the 36th are um, actually not tremendously significant when you compare it to the Welsh regiments and what Lloyd George was able to do for them. So, um, so yes, if you keep your lens within looking at Ireland, Ulster receive more favourable treatment, but when you extend it to the United Kingdom, it appears less significant than one would think. Thank you for that. Des. Done, done. Okay, you saw these weird questions popping up on my screen. Okay, great. So Jonathan, <clears throat> um, when conscription was introduced in Britain in 1916, did it extend to Ireland? No, is the answer, the quick answer. The slightly longer answer is, um, it wasn't extended in Ireland in 1916. In April 1918, Ireland was included in the Military Service Act that was amended then. And this triggered a tremendous protest amongst nationalists in Ireland he did not want to be conscripted by Westminster. Um, maybe there's a further question about this uh, down the line, but conscription is traditionally seen as one of the major, i oh, sorry, the protests against conscription is traditionally seen as one of the major reasons why nationalists couldn't have supported the British war effort, because you have so many people, and it's so evident that they were wholly against uh, conscripted, being conscripted to the British forces. <clears throat> But this has been confused with the issue of recruitment and with the issue of supporting the war. And this is something I do try to get at the heart of in my book. So thank you for that one, Jonathan. Okay, hello, Charles. I have noticed that many of the historians who study 19th century and early 20th century Ireland, including academics, tend to be Irish. That's pretty fair. Do you think more British historians would be welcomed into this field or might they be inhibited by understandable continu continuing sensitivities? 
great question, really great question. Personally, I'd love to see more Irish history taught within the field of British history. Um, and I would really like to see more British historians engaging with the history of Ireland. My own experience has been that British historians tend to be a bit scared by Ireland and they tend to be a bit um, scared of some of the debates, which have been quite inflammatory in the last 50 years, and they don't really want to get involved in them. Um, so I think that's part of the reason. Of course, part of the reason as well is that Irish historians from the 1930s and onwards were trying to write a history of Ireland that was, um, until the revisionist movement of the 1960s, was promoting the nationalist rise to independence, which of course would have um, put, off, put off those thinking about writing it in a different way. But this has all started to change from the 19, actually the 1980s really, um, with revisionism and now what we call post-revisionism. And so quick answer would be yes, I, I think they should be welcomed into the field. I'd have my thumbs up to that one. And um, they shouldn't be inhibited. In fact, I think that the history of the two islands would be greatly benefited if Ireland could be explored within British history and even amongst Irish historians, if they remember that actually whether, whether it was in spirit or not, when Ireland was a part of the United Kingdom, this, lent, this led to new networks, new circulations of people that mean that there's a shared history for the Irish on the two islands. So it's hard, I think, to look at one or the other with a, with a lens that separates one from the other, because actually they were both a shared history for quite a long time. Thank you, Charles. Okay, <clears throat> Mark. One of the most striking differences between Ireland before 1914 and Ireland after 1919 is the change of public attitudes towards home rule. As I understand it, there was strong support for home rule before the war and comparatively little afterwards. To what do you attribute this shift? Another great question. Yes, so home rule really was, the, um, was uh, a measure of self-government that would have granted Ireland a parliament in Dublin. And taking a modern comparison, it would be much less than what Holyrood has today in terms of devolution powers within the United Kingdom. Um, home rule was a major political project and the major political project of Irish nationalism since the 1880s, since really Charles Stuart Parnell, who's a name many of you I'm sure are very familiar with, made it um, and created a party essentially around that. And so three home rule bills had, had gone to parliament and failed from 1886, 1893, then again in 1912, and due to the Parliament Act of 1911, which limited the, the powers of the House of Lords to veto bills passing through, um, passing through Parliament, it meant that the third time the Home Rule was, um, was read uh, through the House of Commons and passed through to the House of Lords in 1912 to 14, the Lords wasn't able to veto it, so it was going to become law. So historians, I mean, why, why then was Home Rule not a big, um, how has it not continued in 1918? Why did Sinn Féin win? Well, this is one of the, the central questions I think I tried to get at as well. So it typically thought that the Easter Rising, the rebellion in the middle of the war, <clears throat> and um, the executions that followed of the rebel leaders transformed opinions in Ireland and led to um, <clears throat> uh, a shift in electoral preferences from the Irish Parliamentary Party through to Sinn Féin, resulting in their, in their victory. And of course, this has, this has a, a very important element in this history. It really, really does. But with the context of the First World War, and as I, as I talk about in my book, particularly in 1918 and the protests over conscription, I think we can greatly complicate this picture. And there's no easy answer to this. That's one of the, one of the, the points I try to get across. There's no simple shift that is from one to the next. There's lots of competing factors. Um, and so, so I can't really give you a clearer answer than really saying it's very complicated. Um, but the executions are indeed a feature, as are the war, the war itself, and particularly when we think about what happened in 1918. Okay, thanks for that, Mark. <coughs> Whoops. Hit the mouse and all of them move up. Okay. Um, Jim. Jim Bennett. Hello, Jim. What arguments were used to motivate Irish volunteers for the war? Were they different from those used from Britain? Yes, they were. It took the recruitment office a bit of time to get its act together. Um, and well, let me start from the start. From the start, the, the propaganda used in Ireland was the same as Britain. Not a huge amount of thought had, gotten in, had gone into it. But by 1915, uh, recruitment authorities in Ireland and in and Britain, because in Ireland they had their own branch too, um, realised they needed to appeal more to what would resonate with people. So you have wonderful posters like Irish farmers and this to defend what you've already secured, um, which you can, you can Google and, and find that one. 
and posts for such disease are sort of dwelling on the political reforms that had happened beforehand. So in Ireland, there had effectively been a revolution in land ownership in the decades after the famine, right up to 1903. <clears throat> 1903 was a significant, uh, a significant date for effectively restoring land ownership to many of the, the farmers who had farmed it, previously they were renting it, um, and it reduced the power of the landlords in Ireland. So these are really uh, like prickly political questions that have been bubbling away amongst in rural Ireland. And so propagandists did pick up on these and started to tailor their, um, their posters as such. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Okay, Tom, it looks like we're headed for another transition in the relationships among Northern Ireland, the rest of the UK and ERA, <clears throat> triggered by the unforeseen complexities of Brexit. What are my concerns about such a transition? Wow, if I had a crystal ball. Um, well, what are my concerns? I, I, I am concerned about um, what happened a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago now, a week and a bit ago, with the Northern Ireland Protocol. The point of the Good Friday Agreement was that it needed international backing because no one of those authorities was able to make a decision on its own without triggering um, opposition and anxiety from another side of the community. And this is why this has any agreement made to do with Northern Ireland must be done in partnership because if one side does it, you are greatly upsetting another. And when I say upset, I mean, you are, you're raising fears and realities that were there not very long ago that become in the forefront of people's minds. And it's really difficult to, um, to undo that. You know, it takes a very long time to build up good community relations and no time at all to destroy them. So that would be one of my concerns, um, legislatively speaking. In terms of Anglo-Irish relations, I'm, I'm, well, I'm very concerned about the economic impact that there will be in Ireland, given that the bulk of trade does go to Britain within the EU currently. And so there's no real clarity on what will happen after that. So, so yeah, so economics and politics, and I'm sure many other things are really concerning to me right now, but I, I won't say any more about that because I could spend an hour speaking about this. Thanks very much, Tom. Okay. Um, and you're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Great. Tony Watts. Hello, Tony. Nice, nice to see you if I could see you. Okay. How has my book been received from the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland? Well, the quick answer to this, Tony, is that I don't know. Um, it only came out at the end of November. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, uh, I don't think that um, uh, too many people have, have read it or finished the reviews yet. Reviews will be coming out later on this year. So so I don't really know, but um, what I do know has been very well received here. It, it won the Whitfield Prize, which is a national prize by the Royal Historical Society. Um, so that's great. Uh, we will see, we will see how it will be received and I will, I will let you know. Thanks very much. Okay, Andrew. Andrew, <clears throat> could you comment on the differences of opinion, if any amongst leaders of the nationalist movement regarding Ireland's involvement in the war? Um, yes, yes. So whenever we think of political parties in the war, we can never think of one party responding in one way, because parties are complicated. We've got really good examples of this today, no matter where you are in the world. Um, different ministers have different views, but the party whip or an equivalence will try to ensure that there's a party line. So there were certainly some. John Redmond, for example, was, was very much actively involved in, in promoting recruiting at least rhetorically. He was sick very often in the war and actually died in March 1918. <clears throat> Pardon me. Some other nationalist MPs were much more wary about promoting recruitment because recruitment has always had very um, prickly connotations in the history of Ireland, Irish men joining the British Army. So it was a weird sort of love-hate relationship. Um, it was never loved, but when Irish men were serving with distinction, that was certainly admired. So there were differences regarding recruitment. Um, the nationalist movement itself as a whole split as a result of John Redmond's um, uh, decision to, to allow Irish men to go to the front. And the split in that movement, let me just circle back briefly, the Irish volunteers, who I showed you a photograph of, the paramilitary organization, had been taken under the control of John Redmond prior to the war. But when John Redmond said that Irish men should go wherever the firing line extends, the bulk of those agreed with him and followed him, but a significant minority did not, about 9,000 to 11,000 men. And some of these contained the radicals <clears throat> who were involved in the Easter Rising and the later movement for independence. So there were certainly differences within nationalist opinion. Thanks, Andrew. 
Okay. What books do you recommend about forgotten histories? Amanda. Oh, um, I'll have to have a think of that one, Amanda. Do you want to drop me an email and I will um, I'll get back to you? Thank you. Richard, can you say a word in the Southern Irish horse where my grandfather served? Oh, Richard, I'd really love to, but my, my knowledge of the individual um, regiments and cavalry units, units is actually very, very poor. Um, I can only say general comments that the many of these cavalry units were, were formed in the initial days of war and amongst the thinking of the military generals at the time, they thought that the war could be decisively won via the cavalry, like it happened in the Napoleonic Wars, for example, but soon they realised that that was not the case. So, so beyond sort of that kind of general answer, I'm, I'm afraid, Richard, I can't, I can't give you more on that, so I'm really, really sorry. Brian Stoker, um, surely not the, the, the Dracula um, author. Anyway, Bram Stoker. Wasn't Irish support for the British in the Great War also dependent on the hope that independence would be granted after the war, which it wasn't. The British held off independence in 1936. Let me read this again. Wasn't Irish support for the British also dependent on the hope that independence would be granted? Okay, thanks, Brian. Yes. Um, well, yes and no. So Home Rule was already passing through Parliament, okay? Um, um, it was passing through Parliament since 1912, and September 1914 was when it was meant to come into law. The war broke out, uh, well, in late July, but Britain entered it on the 4th of August. And that meant that the Ulster question still hadn't been solved. So what, what, what ministers did was they effectively put a sticking plaster on the situation. They said Home Rule would come into law in September 1914, but we'll deal with the Ulster, Ulster question later. So they made a particular provision for Ulster. Um, and many historians who've written about the Irish in the war said that many Irish men joined up to ensure the Home Rule would come into law. And this doesn't quite hold up, but what, it, what might hold up is the fact that once Home Rule became sticking plaster with, of law in September 1914, i.e. it was passed, the Act was passed and therefore become law with the provision for Ulster, many Irish men did join up thinking that Home Rule had been granted. And again, this is something I try to explore in my book. It's been passed over by every historian I can think of. But it's a mentality that actually home rule had been granted. And so many men joined up thinking that home rule was indeed in place. So they were participating for the first time as members of a home rule Ireland, at least in their imagination. Now, of course, home rule didn't come into place uh, um, as such because it was suspended until the end of the war. And the provision, of course, needed to be resolved for Ulster. And events took their own sequence from the Easter Rising onwards, where Home Rule um, became, in a way, defunct, replaced by a more radical agenda. But yes, the answer would be um, uh, sort of, but in a slightly different way to what, you're, to what you're asking. Thanks, Brian. Mark Russell. Okay, Mark, are there any similarities between Ireland's attitude to the First World War and that in Quebec versus Canada? Well, on the outset, you could certainly say there are several, right? The, the tensions between Quebec uh, in Quebec, when we think of French Canadians versus the English speaking Canadians, um, that's, often tip, that's often been compared with Ireland as the reticence between Irish nationalists to fight for Britain. The comparison doesn't really hold up, um, you know, as what I've been trying to say today, given that actually nationalists were very supportive of the war effort. We just haven't really noticed that. Um, so, in some, yes, there's the political issues of, first of all, Quebec seeing itself, French Canadians seeing themselves as a distinct ethnic group, okay, and wanting provision for the French language and education and various things like this. Um, and then the Irish, also, Irish nationalists also wanting similar provisions for them. So yes, that's certainly a, a, a comparison. And in fact, actually in, in Quebec, um, which is of interest, there were many Irish who had emigrated there. And in Montreal, for example, um, an Irish Canadian regiment was raised called the Irish Canadian Rangers, <clears throat> which sent a, a, a battalion to, to the front, the 199th, re actually a regiment, 199th Regiment, one battalion of which visited Ireland during the war in 1917 on a recruitment exercise. Um, so yes, politically there are some similarities and you're talking about the bigger state, Canada, right, versus the smaller state, Quebec, similarly with Ireland versus Britain or versus the United, well, Britain, Okay, and also that saw itself um, Ireland versus the United Kingdom, even though it was part of the United Kingdom. So yes, there are there are there are similarities here for sure, and some differences too. Thank you. 
Okay, Sebastian, you describe anti-German feelings in Ireland following the sinking of the Lusitania, but how strong were pro-German feelings? One would expect a nationalist to side with their enemy's enemy. Ah, their enemy's enemy. Yes, well, <clears throat> some did, that's for sure. Um, so uh, in the middle of the war, Roger Casement, you may have heard of, um, formerly served in a colonial capacity within the British government and became a convert to Irish nationalism, um, went to Germany, went to Berlin in the middle of the war, to try to recruit a brigade of Irish men from uh, Irish prisoners of war who had been captured by the Germans in the initial battles of 1914. Um, and here we have a, a great example of what you've just said, trying to get nationalists to side with the enemy's enemy. Unfortunately, well, uh, well for, unfortunately for Casement, Casement was very unsuccessful in his efforts. Um, and I think he only he recruited one or two men from, from the prisoner of war camps and the rest were, were firmly against what he was doing. So only, only a few there. And then you can say, well, why do people join? For food reasons, for the, the greater, the greater um, freedoms that they were going to be granted by the guards. There's lots of reasons why they could have joined, um, not least of which one might say would be the, the, the reasons the casement was, was saying. So certainly that's one. In Ireland itself, um, you had some affiliation, of course, with, with Germany and um, indeed I mean, the bizarre thing is that before the war, both nationalists and unionists had imported, or well, both of them imported arms from Germany. The only unionists were successful in that in the end. So were they pro-German? Probably not. But I also find quotes from Republicans who, who seem to be, well, they're definitely anti-recruitment and anti-Britain's involvement in the war. And they seem to be pro-German, but they were only as pro-German until if Germany invaded, then they would not be pro-German. And there's fantastic minutes from the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the sort of predecessor to the IRA, talking about what to do if the Germans actually did invade Ireland. Um, and the answer was they would fight them. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, Christopher, thank you for the talk. Very welcome. The First World War in Britain has tended since its end to be thought of in terms of the experience of soldiers, especially those in the trenches, rather than its political context. Was there any similar impact on soldiers' experiences and thought in the years following the war in Ireland? <clears throat> in particular, did the First World War experience contribute to Irish neutrality in the Second World War? Um, really good question. And the interesting point is this hasn't really been looked at. Whenever Irish soldiers came home to Ireland, this has only been a very recent focus of researchers, um, which is quite amazing. And Paul Taylor wrote a book about, um, it was called Heroes or Traitors with Irish Men Returning to Ireland. Um, and he showed actually they were, many of them were not um, treated very badly, which had been the myth for many time, for a long time, but they were actually treated well. And my own research would, would support that on mass as, as well, broadly support that, certainly with the Remembrance Day ceremonies and various things. Did it contribute to Irish neutrality? I think it certainly did. Um, so in the Second World War, for those of you who don't know, the Republic of Ireland was neutral, uh, much to the disdain of Winston Churchill and others. Um, and I think this is because of the memory of the First World War and the complicated, the complicated history that happened. Um, the fact that so many Irishmen had served and had died, and then the, the fact that Westminster had, had bungled the Home Rule deal um, and had made it, it, it developed from 1916 to 18, I haven't spoken about it here, um, and it seemed quite traitorous in the eyes of nationalists to how it amended those deals. These were all at the forefront of de Valera's mind, Eamon de Valera, who was president of Ireland in the Second World War, um, when Ireland was neutral. Also, there were lots of other reasons for being neutral. Ireland felt itself to be, a, it was a very small, it was a small country, terrible economy, didn't really have any resources that it could use and would be unable to defend itself. Um, so there were a few different concerns. One major one, of course, was maintaining Irish sovereignty and maintaining that and ensuring that the same thing wouldn't happen again, where that would be somehow lost or compromised by assisting Britain. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Those were slightly over time, but I hope that's okay from the organizers. You can jump in and tell me to stop if, if um, you need me to. Um, what went wrong when the Second World War came along? Hopefully, anonymous attendee, I've, I've asked that one, answered that one. Um, thank you very much. Carl, <clears throat> I've heard in the past that Germany considered Ireland a potential ally against Britain and that the Irish considered the Germans to be a potential ally. Is that true? If so, what confidence of factors led Germany to alienate Ireland in the way you have described? 
Um, well, I'm not really sure from the German point of view. I don't think Germany did alienate Ireland. And in fact, often, you know, some, some, some elements of the military saw it as a, as a back door into Britain, which, you know, it historically had been um, with the Lords of France, for example. So I don't think Germany alienated Ireland. I um, hope I'm not misreading your question, Carl. Okay, going to the next one. What was behind the GAA's anti-recruitment campaign? <clears throat> um, effectively, because and were there other nationalist organisations opposed? Yes, there were. I mean, nationalists had a very difficult relationship with recruitment to the British Army and had done for a very long time. <clears throat> um, because Irish men serving in the British forces. Okay, 7.30, we need to stop shortly. Yep, I will stop shortly. So only time for a couple more questions. Um, they were opposed because uh, Irish men were not participating freely in their own army. They were participating in the British Army and they weren't getting the acknowledgement for that. Um, and also they'd be dying under a British flag, so to speak, and many nationalists felt very uncomfortable with that. Okay, so jumping through, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer two more questions so everyone knows, that's what it is. Um, why was conscription introduced later in Ireland than Britain? Can you tell us something about the different reaction to it? It was introduced later because politicians in 1916 knew that if they introduced it in 1918, or in, in, if they introduced it in 1916 to Ireland, that that would have been a very bad thing. And they could get away with not doing it at that point. When the German summer offensive, spring offensive happened in 1918, that's when the Eastern Front collapsed because Russia disappeared from the war. And all of those troops from Germany made it over to the Western Front. Then this was very serious. And Britain needed more men, but the British public were also very fed up. And extending that conscription age range down to 18 and up to 51 was going to do tremendous, have a tremendous impact on what the public felt. And so it was felt that Ireland hadn't done its fair share, very often a, a sort of feeling in, in British history, um, definitely communication between the two islands could be improved. But it was felt that Ireland hadn't done its fair share and therefore conscripting Ireland would help to placate British public opinion. And Adrian Gregory has written a bit about this. Okay, thanks, Hilary. <clears throat> um, Ruth, yes, can you say something about how the Irish view in the First World War has shifted? Yes, very briefly, it has shifted. Um, and really since, I would say in this century, in the 21st century, um, Queen Elizabeth visited Ireland and then Northern Ireland in 2011 and 2012. And in some ways that helped to open up a conversation about the First World War that had been a bit tricky before that in the Republic. And since then, I think actually, we know a lot about the First World War and the public has almost had a sense of catharsis by its involvement in the war effort. I think this is less so in Northern Ireland, particularly among many, many nationalists, because it still has the later connotations with the Troubles. But in the, the South of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, um, those connotations aren't strictly there. So, so yes, it has changed. We now know much more about it, but certainly some, some, some nationalists and, and Republicans still feel very uneasy with its memory, the memory that the Irish served in the British forces. And also because the First World War is so complicated we can think of the Second World War and we know the Nazis were bad. We think of the First World War, you know, why did it happen? We're all still scratching our heads. Um, though the wonderful things have been written about that. So, so yeah, I think that's part of the reason. Thanks for that, Ruth. Okay, I would really love to answer all of these questions, but I can't, otherwise my organisers will never ask me to do anything again. Um, so I'm going to have to, to close these down and say thank you all really very much for attending. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I hope you've learned something today. I've certainly learned something from your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, please do attend some of the later events that the Alumni Festival are running. Um, I'm Neve Gallagher and it's been a real pleasure. Thank you and goodbye.